So this morning we're going to be in Ezekiel in the Old Testament, chapters 19 and 20. We're going to start actually with Ezekiel 20. And the last time the message was titled, Personal Responsibility Towards God. And sort of what I said in my prayer this morning is that God sees everything. He sees what's going on with humanity. He set the human race in motion, gave free will. Um, He can see the big things that are happening. But God is also a personal God. And I like to say that God is a great multitasker, right? He can follow groups and wars and all those kind of things, but also just have an intimate relationship with every person on the planet if they so choose something like that. So personal responsibility, um, because the world is so big, and when we're in crowds, we can almost, almost feel, well, what would God think about me? But the truth is, he, he desires a relationship with you. So check that out if you weren't here. Today's message is titled, A Divine Intervention. Um, actually, if you look at interventions today, uh, some of them are televised. I don't recommend that, especially if it's personal stuff. But if someone's going down the wrong path, you know, the family, they all end up in the living room and the person opens the door and they're astonished to see all their loved ones really kind of sitting them down and and doing an intervention because they don't want them, they see they're going on the wrong road. So it's really an act of love if it's done right. But today's message is a divine intervention because God is dealing with his people, 6th century B.C., right before the Babylonian takeover of Jerusalem, which would be coming up in 586 B.C. Uh, And he's trying to plead with his people to change course because they're going in the wrong direction. And as history tells us, God was right because the Babylonians did break through the walls of Jerusalem. And sadly enough, like many wars, there was a lot of sorrow and heartbreak. Uh, In chapter 20, we're going to go through it rather quickly. It's a walk down memory lane. God's going to talk to the children of Israel and just speak about his relationship with them from the beginning. And then in chapter 19, we're gonna see the end of 20 and all of 19, we're gonna see three illustrations or metaphors of how God is trying to do an intervention through metaphors. So we're gonna check that out. Now, before we jump in, uh, and I've gotten some feedback, like a lot of my people that know the Bible or just love an Ezekiel, some people are struggling with Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a very tough book. It's, uh, as you go through it, there's some, you really have to focus on what God is saying in here. We go through Hebrew customs and colloquialisms, et cetera. Uh, What what does that mean to me today? So my suggestion is, especially if you're new to the faith or new to the Bible, that you really focus on what the applications are. So in every section, I'll talk about an application about how God deals with us today, which is really a very important part of teaching the word or homiletics or anything anything of that nature and we're going to look at this in eight parts but before we do that so in Ezekiel 38 and 39 and my Bible students love those chapters there are, I call that dormant prophecy right this is something that was spoken of well over 2,000 years ago and God spoke about sort of like these three last battles that will take place in a world more epic than World War II and uh, he, he speaks about all the different uh, sides, the belligerents, and who's going to take what side in these battles. And again, it's been pretty dormant. It's not been fulfilled. But I got to tell you, this is powerful. In 2021, things are happening today where these prophecies are really coming to light. And it's really exciting because it means the Lord's kingdom is coming at some point in the future. We don't know when. So if we could put up a map of what, do we, what are we talking about in the last few weeks? Now, I want to move the political stuff out of the way. We don't do political stuff at the church. Um, So putting that aside, you know, should we be there? Shouldn't we be there? Um, You know, if we're going to leave, why leave them all this equipment? So there's a lot of questions about an exodus out of Afghanistan. So let me just show you a few things. For my Bible students, who is directly west is Iran, Persian kingdom. We see this, Ezekiel 37, or sorry, uh, 38 and 39. Who is just to the east? China, right? Who is just to the north? As we get further up here, we're looking at Russia. So Russia is also spoken about, right? Pretty powerful map. As a matter of fact, when I covered Revelation 16 last year, I talked about the three autocrats or kings of the east, 
that will move. Now, the Euphrates is right about here. You, you know, the map is kind of cut off, but here's the Euphrates. It speaks about the autocrats of the east moving west into the Battle of Armageddon. Pretty amazing. We had a discussion about that. So I'm just kind of tantalizing you, um, especially if you're new to the things of, of God and the Scripture, that when we, you're going to think that this was written today when we get into this. So this is just a little teaser trailer, so to speak. And what is happening today as we look at these three nations? I can tell you, I've been following news in India. They're really not happy about what's happening. There's a big factor there. Um, and we left billions of dollars worth of uh, Black Hawks, planes, uh, equipment, drones that belong to the United States government now in the hands of the Taliban. As we speak, the Russians and Chinese are getting their hands on that equipment and reverse engineering it, which will take our edge off of the battlefield should we engage in another war. Now, I'm not saying that America should have the upper hand when we talk about Bible prophecy, but what I am telling you is that the events in the last few weeks completely shifted the balance of power in the Middle East. So to some, it seems like incompetent, incompetence, but it, it, it was so ridiculous how it happened, because by the way, there is a vice president, a duly elected, uh, you know, the president left, the vice president, and he's still holed up fighting the Taliban, and we're not giving him any support. So when you look at this as a whole, what you find is that this is exactly how Revelation speaks about the United States really not being in Bible prophecy and the shifting of the balance of power. So what we saw in the last few weeks, forget about what you hear on the media, Read the Bible. This is incredible. So I'm just going to leave it with that. There's a lot more to it, but uh, you'll have to stick with us to uh, get to that. All right, so let's go back. We're going backwards from 2021 to the 6th century B.C., Ezekiel 20, right? It came to pass in the seventh year in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. This is the prophet Ezekiel speaking. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Have you come to inquire of me? As I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired of, of by you. Will you judge them, son of man? Will you judge them? Then make known to them the abominations of their fathers. Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, On the day when I chose Israel and lifted my hand in an oath, to the descendants of the house of Jacob and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt, I lifted my hand in an oath to them saying, I am the Lord your God. On that day, I lifted my hand in an oath, there's a lot of repetition here, uh, to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had searched out for them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all lands. Then I said to them, each of you throw away the abominations which are before your eyes, his eyes, and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me and would not obey. They did not cast away the abominations which were before their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger, but against them, excuse me, against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I acted for my name's sake that it should not be profane before the Gentiles among whom they were, in whom sight I had made myself known to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So one out of eight is you have a situation where the prophet Ezekiel is in Babylon and uh, the elders and clergy and stuff who are in Babylon go before him. Remember we talked about a POW camp, POW village. This is where the Israelites were under the Babylonians. Some, some were still in Jerusalem. And what God is saying to the prophet, because we can't read people's minds, God is saying to the prophet, these guys aren't genuine. I know they're sitting in front of you. I know they're saying they want to hear from me, but let's take them for a walk down memory lane. Let's just do this for a little bit and uh, see where we go, right? We're, we're going to build on this. Uh, so that's one through four, verses one through four, God reminding them that their hearts were not right with him. Uh, in verses five through nine, God made an agreement with the children of Israel to deliver them out of the slavery in Egypt, but many didn't forsake the idols of Egypt, even though they saw, right? We know the story. If we don't know the Bible that well, we maybe seen the TV, the movies, right? The Moses and the parting of the Red Sea and the manna in the wilderness and all that. So it's amazing how people were able to see miracles, but they still didn't 
follow God completely. And listen, this happens today too. You know God is real. You've seen the work in, in your life or, or others, right? And then the question is, with an act of our will, will we follow him or will we still continue in our self-directed life? In verse 9, he says that he preserved them, even though they were doing some wrong things among the Gentiles or the unbelievers at the time, because he made an oath. And he, what does he say here specifically? Is that he did it for the sake of the Gentiles. So God's plan all along wasn't to, God doesn't play favorites, right? We see that in our culture, all this division that's going on. Who's better? Who's worse? God loves everyone the same. So his, his ideal was for the children of Israel to be a positive influence on the unbelievers, the Gentile nations around them. So he said, for the sake of them, looking at the Jewish people saying, you know, your God is real. Wow, he's delivering you. He, God says, I'm going to follow through with this, okay? Verse 10, he says, Therefore I made them go out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness, and I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths. Now remember, this is the old covenant, right? The Sabbath was something between God and the Jewish people. Uh, question, people have a question today about that. Um, in the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, if you are a believer in since Christ, it's not something you have to follow, although it is a smart thing to rest, and it is a smart thing to take a lot of time to, to pray and to, and to seek the Lord. So you see some of those, um, even though it's not a strict observance, you see some of those ideas, how they make a whole lot of sense there. He says, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Yet the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They didn't walk in my statutes. They despised my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they greatly defiled my Sabbaths. Then I said I would pour out my fury on them in the wilderness to consume them. But I acted for my name's sake that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles in whose sight I had brought them out. Again, even today, people look back and they have these ideas. It was the Jews versus the Gentiles. No, no, no. God said, I love all of you, right? The Jews actually were supposed to bring the monotheistic God to the pagan uh, polytheistic Gentiles, right? You see this a lot in here. Um, Sometimes it's culture shock when we actually read the Bible, but we've heard so many preconceived ideas about the Scripture that really aren't true. So I also lifted my hand in an oath to them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all lands, because they despised my judgments and did not walk in my statutes, but profaned my Sabbaths, for their heart went after their idols. Nevertheless, my eyes spared them from destruction, I did not make an end of them in the wilderness, right? We see this in Exodus. We've covered this uh, in detail. But I said to the children in the wilderness, do not walk in the statutes of your fathers, nor observe their judgments, nor defile yourself with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes, keep my judgments, and do them. Hallow my Sabbaths, and you will be a sign, they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Notwithstanding, the children rebelled against me. Not necessarily meaning the seven and eight year olds, meaning their progeny, which were, many of them were adults, right? They, uh, God wouldn't put such a heavy burden on little kids, okay? We, you have to, you know, follow what's the context here. They did not walk in my statutes, were not careful to observe my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them, but they profane my Sabbaths. Then I said I would pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them in the wilderness. Nevertheless, I withdrew my hand and acted for my name's sake that it should not be profaned in the sight of the Gentiles. We keep seeing this. In whose sight I had brought them out. Also, I lifted my hand in an oath to those in the wilderness that I would scatter them among the Gentiles and disperse them through the countries because they had not executed my judgments but had despised my statutes, profaned my Sabbaths, and their eyes were fixed on their father's idols. Therefore, I also gave them up to statutes that were not good. They let them have their way. They don't want to follow God's way. They went their own way. They changed the rules, changed the laws. God's like, you got free will, but it's not going to end well for you. I sort of see that in our country today, right? Where are we going as a nation? 
Um, and I pronounced them unclean because of their ritual gifts and that they caused all their firstborn to pass through the fire that I might make them desolate and they might know that I am the Lord. Okay, so two out of eight in the wilderness. Verses 10 through 17 speaks about the, the older generation when they came out of Egypt through the Red Sea, right? They started, you know, hiding the, the idols from the Egyptians, maybe in their in their luggage, um, they were doing some bad practices. And in verse 18 through 26, God speaks to the next generation to try to get them to understand don't follow in the sins of your parents. And we've actually been talking about this uh, a few Sundays now, about generational sins and seeing maybe dysfunction in our own families, right? Blood is thicker than water, which is really shouldn't be a true saying. You know, we should carve our own way if it's if their way is unrighteous you know i think about my parents generation and you know me bro growing up in a, a broken home and how i was failed by my parents generation but i also look at my generation and how some in our generation have failed the the kids right uh, that are younger than us so you know we have to break those generational dysfunctions in a spiritual sense um, i have to kind of make a note about VBS, which we were doing with the kids all last week. Just the kids were so excited to, to learn about God on their level. It's like, why do we do this as a church? It was so much work for so many of us, but we do it because we want to give the next generation a fighting chance to do right and maybe to fix the mistakes of my generation, right? We have to be objective when we look at you know, things and not have this attitude that we know how to do it best. So there's a lot to this. And verse 26, um, those many of you do know this expression. For those that don't, is when he talked about having their firstborn pass through the fire. Let's just say, uh, I don't want to be graphic, but it was child abuse. It was horrible, and the children would often perish because of it. These were some really horrible practices that um, supposedly God's people, right, were, were engaging in. But, you know, even Jesus said in the church there would be wheat, there would be good, and there would be tares. There would be bad people that would work their way in with a, with a pretentiousness and an appearance that they're godly people, but they would do bad things. So my point is not that God needs me to defend him, but God is not a petty God. When he was angry at the people, he had every right to be. They were doing some horrific things that in some scripture he said, you're doing worse things than the, the cultures that don't even know me. You should be ashamed of yourself. So there's a, there's a lot going on here. Now in the wilderness, because I'm going to make a comparison here, times were tough, right? The wilderness, the desert, I mean, it wasn't pretty. God had to provide water for them, food, manna from heaven. And it was great to see the miracles, but the wilderness was not a place that you want to raise a family in. It was a temporary thing. So you see uh, bad behavior in a place of want. Now hold that thought. Two more verses, right? Verse 27, Therefore, son of man, right, this is under the heading of in Canaan, or the promised land, speak to the house of Israel and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, in this too also, your fathers have blasphemed me by being unfaithful to me. For when I brought them into the land for which I had lifted my hand in an oath to give them, and they saw all the high hills, oh my goodness, the promised land was beautiful, the high hills and all the thick trees, that they offered their sacrifices and provoked me with their offerings. There they also sent up their sweet aroma and poured out their drink offerings. So three out of eight is in the promised land. What they would do is they would see, wow, this is beautiful. This, it's lush, it's green, it's so much nicer than the wilderness and the desert. And then they started offering this, these idolatry, right? These offerings to these false gods. And God's like, well, you know, I'm paraphrasing. What are you guys doing? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So when you, you go from pro poverty to provision, you know, listen, we do this in our culture, right? And you see with all the spending plans and you know, we're going to fix so many things in America, and our government has this philosophy, just keep throwing money, 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 money. Sort of like this impersonal force that just throws money in a situation. Sadly enough, sometimes that money comes back to these politicians, and you wonder how they leave office 
after 10, 20 years, and they and all their kids are rich, but they didn't come in rich. Right? How does that happen? Media doesn't follow the money anymore. Um, but the government's idea is just keep throwing money at problems, and you'll make people happy by telling them that you're just going to keep throwing money at them. Well, according to this, the children of Israel had every, anything they could ever want in the promised land, milk, honey, you know, green trees, um, beautifully want, running natural water. There was nothing that they needed. And what happened? There was a lot of good people, right? No culture is a monolith. You have good and bad in, in every culture. Uh, but the bad people, whether they were in the, the wilderness, the poverty, or the, the riches of the promised land, their hearts were still bad. So that's the part that um, secular government misses. And that's what we try to preach as people of faith, is that there's an element of God that's so important that we can't miss that. If we don't have God, right, what happens to our culture? We start to see it decline. And you've seen it right here. Like this walk down memory lane. So verse 29, okay, we continue. Then I said to them, what is this high place to which you go? So its name is called Bama to this day, which means high place. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, are you defiling yourselves in the manner of your fathers and committing harlotry according to their own abominations? For when you offer your gifts and make your sons pass through the fire, second time he mentions it, you defile yourselves with all your idols even to this day. So shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel, as I live, says the Lord God? I will not be inquired of by you. What you have in your mind shall never be when you say we will be like the Gentiles, like the families in other countries serving wood and stone. So there, uh, four out of eight is, we're talking about now in Ezekiel's time. So God takes them down this historical, um, he, he, you know, sometimes we, we tend to forget. And, you know, as a Christian, I know what my life was like before I knew the Lord. And I, I wasn't a good person. You know, I, I don't believe, looking at myself and my former life, that I was a good person. Um, so for me to actually come up here and act to all of you like I'm wonderful would be disingenuous. And I, it's hard, it would be hard for me to look in the mirror. Because you know what? Anything good that I am today... It's God who did it through my life. He cleans me up. But some people have the attitude that, you know, they forget the past. They forget where they came from. They forget the hungry years. They forget how the Lord or other people had helped them. So it's, I tell you what, there's a lot of themes in here that are timeless, you know? It doesn't matter this book was written 2,600 years ago. We can still make applications today. So what was God saying to the clergy, to the leaders, to the people? Your hearts need to change, otherwise I'm not going to entertain you. Psalm 66, 18, if I re regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. So they were going before the Lord, supposedly asking for the Lord's advice, but they were doing evil things. And God was basically saying, you guys are double-minded. It's not going to work. Jeremiah 29, 13, some people say, and, and I hear a lot of complaints well, not a lot. Some complaints about God, and one is, he, he doesn't listen to me. Okay. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, if you seek the Lord, you will be found by the Lord when you seek him with what? Your whole heart. Amen. Before I was a Christian, believe it or not, I did call out to the Lord, usually on a Saturday, Saturday morning after, you know, or Sunday morning or Monday morning after a long binge of partying and I was sick to my stomach and I still remember the foolishness calling out to the Lord. Oh, I don't feel good. I'm so sick. <laughs> and then when I felt better, I would just go back to ignoring him again. No, it doesn't work like that. When you seek the Lord, he knows if your heart is genuine towards him. You got to seek him because you want him not just because you want a quick fix and then ignore them again. So these are incredible uh, themes that, that run through even today. He was trying to tell them, your heart needs to change, and then I can work with you. But some are, even today, they're stuck in their spiritual dysfunction. They have a hard time changing. Last few verses of this chapter, he says, As I live, says the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with fury, 
pure, poured out, I will rule over you. I will bring you out of the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered, right? If you know the history, uh, Israel's history, a lot of this stuff makes perfect sense. You can just plug it into the timeline. You can go into secular sources in history and find the same thing. The history is history. Um, I will gather you out of the countries where you're scattered with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out. I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will plead my case with you face to face. God is a reasoning God. Just as I pleaded my case with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will plead my case with you, says the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod. I will bring you into the bond of the covenant or the agreement between God and his people. I will purge the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the country where they sojourn, but they shall not enter the land of Israel, then you will know that I am the Lord. As for you, house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, go, serve every one of your, his idols, and hereafter, if you will not obey me, but profane my holy name, no more with your gifts and your idols. For on my holy mountain, on the mountain height of Israel, says the Lord God, there all the house of Israel, all of them in the land shall serve me. There I will accept them, there I will require your offerings and your first fruits of your sacrifices together with your holy things. I will accept you as a sweet aroma when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you have been scattered. And I will be hallowed in you before the Gentiles. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for which I lifted my hand in an oath to give to your fathers. And then you shall remember your ways and your doings with which you were defiled, you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight because of the, all the evils you have committed. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have dealt with you for my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doings, O house of Israel, says the Lord. This is a tough book. <laughs> so it's, that's why I do the applications, and you know that's really the important part because just like with the children of Israel, God said, hey, this is what I have to say to you, but but he would pull out the part about them having a relationship with him. You know, sometimes he had to go into a lot of context and filler for them to get the points that they needed to get. Okay, so five out of eight is the message of God's future restoration of Israel. And again, the silver lining is verses 33 through 38. His desire to reason with his people. But for those that chose to stay in their wickedness, he said, I will purge the rebels. Right? It's the, sort of the precursor to the police force. <laughs> so God was going to do that specifically. Um, he did it in the wilderness. He's done it often through the ages so that the societies didn't get completely corrupted. Isaiah 1, it says, God says, come let us reason together. So God is a reasoning God. He gave us a brain. He gave us the ability to think, to, to understand that we consciously exist, to debate, to, um, to investigate and ponder things because he made us in his image. He can do the same thing. So I don't criticize people, but when they follow religions where you know, God is in the trees and, and God is part of the, you know, the pews and God is in everything, but he's an impersonal force, I'm trying not to, I guess I'm being facetious. I have an issue with that because God is a reasoning God. You can't have something that's inanimate and impersonal create something that's highly complex and reasoning. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't make sense logically, right? My days at Rutgers University and all the logic and debate classes I took, um, there was some good, good stuff that I took that I actually use today as a pastor. But verse 39 through 44, he speaks about this great regathering. Yes, it happened in 1948 when Israel became a nation not long after World War II but he's also speaking of a future time where there's a great regathering of Israel with Israel's borders. There's a mass repentance according to Zechariah 12. And everyone collectively realizes when they see the Lord's return, wow, that is him. And, and they, like we do as Christians, they, you know, they trust him as their Lord and Savior. So it's going to be a great time. But what does God do? He gives solid counsel. He says to the people to take responsibility, right, to repent, and then to move forward. And that is part of the problem in our culture today. We have a culture 
I'll get to it right at the end, but I, I had a really awesome debate with two people last night. <laughs> it's amazing I was able to get any study done. Um, and it just, the situation just manifested itself, but it was very amical. It was, I really enjoyed both of them. Um, so today in our culture, and it was so cool because the guy, he was an attorney, and he's an atheist, and I'm trying to work with him. And uh, his wife was there, and she was kind of making faces at him, and he was like, no, 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 no. He goes, this is good. We could disagree and be amicable. And I said, her, I said listen, I, I love your husband. I think he's a great guy, you know. I have no problem with this, you know. I'm, I'm half the problem because I'm trying to impose my opinion on him. So, um, but he, he made a great point. He said, we've lost that in our culture. Well, of course, he's an attorney, so he does a lot of arguing. Is that today, you, you, someone has a difference of an opinion, and they get triggered. Everybody's triggered today. Oh my goodness. I was born in 67, so I'm, I'm trying to get used to all this triggering, you know what I'm saying? The stuff that I did as a kid, man, it was rough. So, um, so I'm just trying to respect the culture and, and try to understand it, but get the point and, and get them saved at the same time. So there's a lot to this. Uh, but our culture has a hard time saying to itself, I'm wrong. You know, we go on social media, we take a million pictures of ourselves. Well, I don't, but a lot of people do. Um, and you almost, it almost becomes your kingdom. You know, you can get 100 likes and your dopamine in your brain starts to move and you get excited, it's a good feeling. And I'm not criticizing it, but our culture has cultivated just almost we have our own little city-states in, in, in a person. You know, and, and if anybody, and I've, I've heard this, I've read studies, psychological studies, how uh, even political people, people in one party can't be friends on social media with the other party, and that's dangerous, by the way. That really is dangerous. I love the fact that I know so many people that don't agree with me. I have a lot of friends that are atheists, and I'm still working on them. Some of them are close, you know what I'm saying? But I love them, you know? I want them to know God. So... People from, from our culture can read Ezekiel and it's culture shock. What kind of book is this? Don't get triggered, you know, just relax. Just try to absorb it and let's go through some of these, um, some of these applications. Verse 45. Furthermore, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward the south, preach against the south, and prophesy against the forest land, the south, and say to the forest of the south, um, he said that a bunch of times. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will kindle a fire. So this is where the three metaphors come in. The fire, right? The lions and the, the vine. So I'll go through these very quickly. Um, I'll kindle, kindle a fire in you and it shall devour every green tree and every dry tree in you. The blazing flame shall not be quenched and all faces from the south to the north shall be scorched by it. All flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it. It shall not be quenched. Then I said, ah, Lord God, they say to me, does he not speak in parables? That's key. We're going to get to that. So six out of eight is we're going from a, a walk down memory lane to a forest fire. Now, in our culture, we would call this a dumpster fire, right? People use that. I've seen a lot of dumpster fires, by the way, in my career. And you want to keep it away from something else that could get, you never know what people are throwing out. That being said, uh, the Lord is saying, if you continue down this path, your, your nation is going to become a forest fire because you're, you're provoking the Babylonians, especially King Nebuchadnezzar, who's a prideful man, and he's vindictive. And God was right. 586 BC, you could read about what the Babylonians did when they invaded Jerusalem, but God was trying to prevent that. He was trying to warn them. So when you look at where Ezekiel was in Babylon, and the names have changed, and when I put that map up, you can see remnants of the Babylonian and the Persian empires, right? Um, some of these empires, they grow and they absorb other cultures, and then when they get weaker, they let go of those cultures. Iran, Afghanistan, they are very ancient lands, the Middle East is a very ancient place, and we're going to get to that when we get to Ezekiel 38, 39. It's going to blow your mind. You're going to say, how could this be? How did it have so much detail about the things that are happening in 2021? It's mind-blowing. Okay, so Ezekiel was in Babylon. He was one of the first deportees, right? I think in the second wave. So where he was sitting 
when God was telling him this is going to happen in the south, it was sort of south-southwest of where Ezekiel was, where Jerusalem was, and where the Babylonians were going to attack next. So he's telling them this in advance. Pretty powerful stuff. Here's the sad part. So the, the clergy, the elders, the leaders come before the prophet, because they know he definitely hears from God. Everything he says comes true. And they're a little pretentious. They're hiding their hearts. Um, they have idols in their hearts. And God is saying, um, Ezekiel, I see right through them. So Ezekiel takes them through memory lane, right? He takes them through um, these, these parables, these illustrations, and they say, doesn't he speak in parables? Now, it doesn't come out in the English, but... This was similar to when Jesus would teach in parables. And what Jesus was doing was, a lot of people were following Jesus because he was raising the dead. I mean, who wouldn't follow somebody who did that? Raising the dead, making food appear out of nothing, healing the lame, the eyes of the blind are open. So Jesus, because he's fully God, fully man, and he loved people, surely he wanted to help the disabled and make everybody whole. But his bigger concern, because that's only for this life, like today, his bigger concern is their soul, that when people die, they go to the right place, right? He spoke about the wide path and the narrow path. But what happened was, I would say the majority from what I read in Scripture, so Jesus had crowds of hundreds, thousands, of course. His fame spread all over the place. Um, but what he really wanted was followers to follow him because he wanted them to have a relationship with the living God. And at this church, we could talk about anything. We could talk about politics, we could talk about current affairs, but we don't really because, again, Republican, Democrat, I mean, honestly, the kingdom of heaven is so much greater than that, and this is where everybody's fighting. Black, white, Republican, Democrat, rural people versus city people. Every day on TV, you see this division, division, division. What God is saying is what I have to offer is so much greater than that. All those things that I just mentioned, they're not going to stand for eternity. But you being in heaven, right, with different people, different groups, right, different, that's going to stand the test of time because eternity is a very long time. So going back to the parable part, they criticized Jesus for speaking what, he, what they thought were parables or riddles. Oh, he's just telling these fanciful things. They did the same thing to Ezekiel. The leaders, you know what it is? The leaders didn't like what he had to say. You know when you're, when, you're, when you're guilty of something, and I've been there, and then somebody, like, they catch on to what you're doing, and you start to get very uncomfortable. And you you want to leave, you know what I'm saying? So what was happening was he was getting very close to their heart and their defenses and the walls they had put up because who was directing him? God. So they didn't like what he had to say, and they blow him off as somebody who's speaking in parables or riddles. So that's where we're at with that. Okay, so just going back to chapter 19, and I'm going to do this quickly. Moreover, take up a lamentation. This is the second uh, metaphor or illustration. Take up a lamentation for the princes of Israel and say, What is your mother? A lioness. She lay down among the lions. Among the lions, she nourished her cubs. She brought up one of her cubs, and he became a young lion. He learned to catch prey, and he devoured men not in a good way. The nations also heard of him. He was trapped in their pit, and they brought him with chains to the land of Egypt. When she saw that, that she waited, that her hope was lost. Then she took another one of her cubs and made him a young lion. He roved among the lions, became a young lion. He learned to catch prey. He devoured men. He wasn't a good guy either. He knew their desolate places and laid waste their cities. The land with its fullness was desolated by the noise of his roaring. Then the nations said against him, from the provinces on every side and spread their net over him. He was trapped in their pit. They put him in a cage with chains and brought him to the king of now Babylon. They brought him in nets that his voice should no longer be heard on the mountains of Israel. So seven out of eight, we got one more to go, is the lament for the princes of Israel. So the lioness, and you got to look at this. It's easy for us because of hindsight because history has already passed, right, in this situation. The lioness was Israel. She lay among the lions, which were the surrounding nations. The first cub was King Jehoahaz. 
He devoured men, but it was a short but brutal reign. He was forcibly taken by Pharaoh Nicho, a real figure. Look it up in the history books. 609 BC, Pharaoh Nicho and his forces captured him and brought him forcefully with his family to Egypt. He's skipping over Jeho Jehoiakim, who is the next king, because he's making a point. The second cub is Jehoiachin, who came after Jehoiakim. You don't have to, there's not going to be a test on this. <laughs> and then after Jehoiakim comes Zedekiah, I just, it's all in my head here. Um, so the second cub was Jehoiachin, also a wicked man. He wasn't captured by Egypt, but he was captured by Babylon. E Israel was situated between Egypt and the Babylonian Empire, and it was sort of a tug of war because they had lost their moral compass. They didn't have God to guide them anymore, their choice. So they were left to the forces of Israel, um, Egypt flexing its muscles, and then Babylon flexing its muscles. So that's what's happening here. And the point that he's making is he's saying that this is going to happen before it happens. He's trying to warn them, don't do this. They fully will, well know, n knew what he was saying here. And you know what? Where does that leave world leaders today? I don't know about you, but I, I mean, I, I listen to Trudeau. I listen to uh, Xi Jinping. I listen to Putin. I listen to Biden. I listen to uh, Merkel and all these world leaders. And uh, you, we're starting to lose in our country and in the world people in power that ha have at least a healthy fear of God. So guess what? According to the scripture, growing pains of humanity, things are just going to get worse. And I could say that with a smile, not because I'm demented, but because I know eventually the Lord's kingdom is coming, right? That's right in the Lord's prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We don't memorize that and say it for the sake of saying it. We say it because we believe it and Jesus promised it to us. So last uh, metaphor, and then we'll close, is verse 10. He says, your mother was like a vine in your bloodline planted by the waters, fruitful and full of branches because of many waters. She had strong branches for scepters of rulers. She towered in stature above thick branches, as was seen in her height and the dense foliage. But she was plucked up in the fury. She was cast down to the ground. And the east wind, which was a picture of Babylon because they came from the east, dried her fruit, her strong branches were broken and withered, the fire consumed them, and now she is planted in the wilderness in a dry and thirsty land. Fire has come out from a rod of her branches and devoured her fruit so that she has no strong branch, a scepter for ruling. This is a lamentation and has become a lamentation. So eight out of eight is the par parable of the withered vine. The reason why I'm not going into so much like this verse and that verse is because these themes keep building on each other. We've been, we talked about Israel as the vine. We actually read John 15 where Jesus speaks about himself as the vine with believers as the branches bearing fruit because of his, you know, innervation or, um, you, you know, the, how he influxes us with the power to do these things, good deeds and such like that. But going back to Israel, when Israel was close to God, Right? This covenant relationship, it was fruitful and full of branches. When Israel turned its back on God, man, great lesson for all the nations today, she withered up and her fruit dried up. Okay? Simple. Listen, if you're new to this book, after Ezekiel and all the really neat prophecies, we're going to be in the Gospels. We're going to be in the Gospel of Luke. So, if you're struggling through Ezekiel, hold on. <laughs> Wait till we get into Luke. Just like when we were in Revelation. We, we just, we, I sort of do New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, so we go through these books kind of in succession. The sermon is titled The Divine Intervention. And again, I've made the application, where are we as a nation? We can easily do that. It's very easy to come to church, hear something, but not hear it for ourselves. It's for somebody else, right? But as individuals, how do we apply this to our lives? How do we apply this to our lives, right? How do we turn on the news? I suggest don't watch it for too long. I like to be informed, but I can't watch it a lot because it's, it's really kind of depressing. 
it's a long story, the psychological uh, capture with uh, bad news and, and people are addicted to bad news. It's, it's psychological. It's good for the ads and the corporate corporations that run the media and all that kind of stuff, but that's a whole other topic. Jesus said in John 16, 33, in this world you will have trials. You will have tribulation. Jesus also said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You want to know how? People ask me all the time as a Christian, how do you do it, Pastor Joe? How do you know so much about the sadness about, and the hopelessness of this world, but you have like a, an upbeat attitude? And the answer is that Jesus told us that it was going to get worse before it gets better. And, you know, we, listen, I have a child. Um, some of you have kids, and you're concerned. But let me tell you something. You raise them up in the way of the Lord. And when all this ends, you will not be disappointed. There will be no regrets when the Lord returns. Not at all. So I would say that where are we as individuals with God? It's very easy to look at Babylon and Israelites and remote things. The world, but where are we? And through this message, is the Lord trying to knock on the door of our heart? As much as he loved the Israelites and wanted them to change, he also wants that from us. Now, some of you are strong walking believers. Some of you are seeking. Some of you are not sure where you stand. Let this message clear away all the stuff that maybe you don't understand and look at the application of God trying to knock on the door of your heart. Amen? So this world is passing away. The Bible does tell us. And guess what? History repeats itself. You would think that world leaders would at least study history you know, as they, as they become part of these, these cycles, these, these dysfunctional cycles that we've seen all throughout history, we're making the same mistakes today. However, as I said about the last message, God cares for us as individuals. So give him your heart. Maybe today is the day that you're going to do that. Let's pray.